Life, for most of us, feels like a movie we've arrived to 40 minutes late. Sure, good things happen, sometimes beautiful things, but tragic things happen too. What does it all mean? We find ourselves in the middle of a story that is sometimes wonderful, sometimes awful, usually a confusing mixture of both, and we haven't a clue how to make sense of it all. No wonder we keep losing heart. We need to know the rest of the story. For when we were born, we were born into the middle of a great story begun before the dawn of time, a story of adventure, of risk and loss, heroism and betrayal, a story where good is warring against evil, danger lurks around every corner, and glorious deeds wait to be done. Think of all those stories you've ever loved. There's a reason they stirred your heart. They've been trying to tell you about the true epic ever since you were young. There is a larger story, and you have a crucial role to play. That's from the back cover of John Eldridge's book, Epic. I'm Alan Arnold, and you're listening to the Ransomed Heart Podcast. In this week's podcast, we wanted to do something special. We're going to let you in to one of the sessions from our August boot camp. Now, we've been back barely a week, but this was one of the most amazing events where 430 men came for four days deep into the mountains of Colorado to discover the larger story that God is telling and the larger story that they are living. The session you're about to hear is John Eldridge, where he presents the message of the larger story. Your life is a story. It's not a random series of facts and events and disconnected happenings, right? Good things, bad things, boring things. Your life is a story. And your story is like a chapter from a larger book. And it only makes sense. You only make sense when you have the rest of the story, right? But the story that was supposed to bring interpretation to us has been totally ripped off from us, from the church. The evil one has taken away the story of God from the world, and he's left us with religion. And he's happy for people to spend their entire lives going through religious experiences with no interpretation and without it actually giving them their hearts back, right? You can go through all the motions in the world. He's like, knock yourself out, live a moral life because it doesn't work, right? But he can warehouse millions of people into a religious context. But what we need is restoration, right? What we need is wholeheartedness. What we need is intimacy with God and the recovery of the warrior in us and the lover, right? And the life that we were meant to live, to find our story, to make sense of the story that that, that we've lived so far and to find our way into the story that God has for us. Christianity was supposed to do that for us. It was supposed to be the story within which we can find interpretation and restoration. We can find the skills and the cunning to defeat the enemy, the breakthrough, all of that, right? I've come that you may have life, life. But that story got stolen along the way. And I'm not opposed to the church. I'm not railing against the body of Christ. I'm saying the story has been stolen. It's like taking the entire juicy parts of the orange out and just leaving you with the husk, with the peel. And that's, that's all that's left now. It's pretty awful. When we sent uh, SEAL Team 6 in to take out bin Laden, they rehearsed that over and over and over again. They built a replica of the compound so that to the best of their knowledge, right, with all the variables, you know, that, that go on, like to the best of their knowledge, this is what it's like, this is who's in there, here's what we think is going to go down, right? They, they had situational awareness. They didn't just say, hey, can we have some volunteers to go in and take out Bin Laden? And, Super, you're on a helicopter tonight, right? There's, pra- there's training, there's preparation, there's orientation. Let's do the same thing here in the West with wildfires every summer, right? These massive wildfires that that sweep through, you know, Colorado and Idaho and Wyoming and Montana. When you train smoke jumpers, the first thing they get is situational awareness. Here's the wind direction. This is what we think the fire is going to do in the next 24 hours. And most importantly, this is the escape route if things go south. And then we drop you in, right? Situational awareness, orientation, interpretation, 
oh, it's worth everything. I want to try and offer that to you this weekend. We want to try and help you understand your story. We're going to try and help you understand what God is doing now in your story, why some of the things have happened that have happened, and most importantly, like how to move forward into integration and wholeheartedness and an authentic masculinity that's full of life and goodness and joy. For most guys, man, they're just stuck in the questions. Why is life so hard? Why is every good thing so opposed? I mean, just a a birthday for heaven's sakes, a, a vacation, just anything you try and do. Why is that? Why are so few marriages filled with joy? like playfulness, like happy, happiness in the marriage. Why why is that so rare? Why do our addictions honestly, really feel like our only shot at life? That's why they're so powerful. Because truth be told, whatever else is going on in our world, like that stuff, you know, at least it feels like a little bit of something. Why is that? I want to point out a couple things to give us some orientation. First off, life is a story. Clearly, right? Clearly, life is a story. And this is going to be very, very helpful to you. All of the great stories that you love, novels, poems, songs, myths, legends, um, video games, like the movies that you love, all the great stories are actually telling the same exact story. They all borrow literally their structure or their story, you know, line from one story. There's only one story. It is the story of God. And every great like myth and every powerful trailer and everything we do, that if it speaks to your heart, the reason that it does is it's borrowing its power from the real story. This is, this is going to be super helpful. This isn't just entertainment. It's not just, yeah, that's cool. Something is actually speaking to you answers to the riddle of your life. There is a cohesion there. There is a story there. Okay? God is telling a story. When Jesus shows up, you are the son of God. You are entrusted with the gospel, the message that is you know, going to either rescue or not rescue the human race. Okay? Would you go about it like this? There was a sower who had some seed, Right? And he went out in this field. There was this gal who lost her coin, and so she swept her house. There was this yeast, and it got put into some dough. You're like, could you be a little more clear? What is with the vagueness, right? What is with all that stuff? Like children's stories, fables, fairy tales, parables? Jesus is absolutely brilliant. He's the smartest person who ever lived, right? He knows exactly what he's doing. Story is the language of the heart right? If you want to engage the heart, you have to go with story. God is telling a story. The scripture doesn't read like a theological textbook. The scripture reads like a bunch of stories that all fit together into this large sweeping story. And when you get together with with your pals, the first thing you start doing is telling stories. How you been? Oh man, you're not going to believe what happened last week. And you tell a story, right? oh man, I wrecked my car. What? What happened? Yeah, I was coming down. Right? You start telling stories. Story provides orientation, context, and interpretation. Story is everything. Right? And so what I want to do this morning together is recover the story that we're living in. Because the really good news is this, that heart that we talked about last night, those films that you wrote down in love, you were given that heart to fit within one very specific story. Your heart is literally designed to operate within, be fueled by, be thrilled by, and fight in one particular story, okay? And the story goes like this. In the beginning, once upon a time. In the beginning, it's used twice in Scripture, Most of you guys are thinking of Genesis chapter one. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, here we go. Right, Bible study. Okay, I can take this. I've been here before, right? Sunday school. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Actually, you can't start there because that's act three. That's act three. 
That's coming into the movie 45 minutes late. The Hebrew actually says, when God began to create the heavens and the earth. And before that, before that, because we already know that there is evil in the story, right? Evil is going to come into the garden in Genesis 3 and try and take out the human race. Where'd that come from? Where'd these fallen angels come from? Okay, you got to go to John chapter 1, the gospel of John chapter 1. And he's doing this very deliberately when John wrote his gospel. He knew what his listeners would do with this. And then he does this fabulous twist. He says, in the beginning, and they're like, okay, here we go. Yeah, you know, we are good Jews. We know our Bible. He's taking us back to Genesis. He goes, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God in the beginning. In the beginning, in the once upon a time before all time, is the heroic fellowship of the Trinity. Now, I want to show you something really cool. Um, If you ask guys to tell you this weekend some of the great adventures of their life, very few of those adventures will be alone. And if you want to ask guys about some of the most meaningful moments of their lives, it's going to be with other men or an uncle or a grandfather, maybe their dad. Like we are literally made in the image of the Trinity. We are made for heroic fellowship and all these battles, you know, trailers and stuff. And it's all about the guy next to you, right? Yeah, it is. You are made in the image, right, of a heroic God who lives in this life of deep connectedness, not isolation, not loneliness, connectedness, beauty, intimacy, adventure, battle, you long for those things because God does. Because that's his life, the heroic fellowship of the Trinity. God is living a great adventure and a great battle. And he bestowed in you a heart like his. This is a very cool thing. The particular things you love, he loves. You share the same loves, right? You share the same likes. You long for the same things. As a young man, I had a lot of adventures, rock climbing, backpacking, uh, fly fishing, different things I did. But my far greater joy now as a father is to share those things with my sons, right? To invite them into their first elk hunt and now to be going next month caribou bow hunting together right, to invite them into rock climbing and teach them how to climb. And now they're better climbers than I am, right? And they take the lead and I follow. That's awesome stuff, right? The human heart longs for that. Every little boy longs for that. I was raised in the suburbs of LA, but every summer I was shipped off to my grandfather's cattle ranch in Eastern Oregon killer way for a boy to spend his summer vacations, right? You go from strip malls and, you know, doing nothing all summer to like, here's a horse, saddle up. Remember the summer my father, grandfather bought me a BB gun. I was a little guy. I was like eight years old. Bought me a BB gun in one of those quart-sized containers of BBs and told me to kill all the pigeons on the ranch, right? To be armed and dangerous as a little guy, to be sent out there to do justice in the world, to be invited into a larger story. The thing that just kills a man is when you feel like if anything good is going to happen, I have to make it happen. That's the thing that just kills you, right? If any goodness is going to come my way, I got to pay for it. I got to make it happen, right? It's up to me. But the invitation of the gospel is the invitation to join God in the story that he is telling, to come and take your part, take your unique role as his son in that story. We long for this. In fact, the father-son relationship is the most powerful relationship in the universe because of the father and the son. Because at the center of reality is this heroic fellowship, Act 1, the heroic fellowship of the Trinity. Act 2, why does every story have evil to it, right? You look at the trailers we saw this morning, Gladiator, right? The 
general who became a slave, the slave who became a gladiator, the gladiator who defied an empire. Like Maximus is assaulted. He is betrayed. His family is murdered. He is sent to die in the arena, but instead he is used to overthrow evil. Why does every story have that? Every story has a fight with evil. You can't make or write an interesting movie without it. You just can't. I mean, even if you're writing, you know, stories of overcoming plagues or whatever, they always turn it, even with ominous music, into some sort of fight, you know, against the enemy. Right? This is so core to human experience because of our story because of our story. Braveheart, right? The evil King Longshanks. In Star Wars, you've got Darth Vader or the Empire or Darth Sidious or, you know, Palpatine. You see this? Every single story has a great battle with evil to it. It has an enemy. Why? Because your story does. But most of you don't live like that. Most of you don't live like that. This is where some really messed up interpretation gets in. Most of you live like it's you and it's God and other people and somebody's not coming through for you, right? You end up feeling betrayed by God. You end up resenting him and blaming the assault on him or on other people when in fact scripture says we wrestle not against flesh and blood. We are involved in a great war with evil right now. How do you interpret the news, guys? Seriously, terrorist bombings, child abuse, human trafficking of little boys and girls into the sex trade. Exactly what do you do with this story? How do you interpret that? Because if you don't have a healthy appreciation for the enemy and the war in which you live, you will end up blaming it on God or your spouse, other people, or yourself. Okay? There is an enemy. In Act 2, prior to Genesis chapter 3, prior to the human experience, God creates the angels. And this is a fascinating thing. The angels are mighty armed warriors. Why is that? Why is that? What kind of story is God writing? One angel in the book of 2 Kings, one angel destroys the entire Assyrian army. <laughs> You're like, whoa, 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 can I, hang on a second. Like, what kind of story have I found myself in? Why does God create these mighty, powerful warriors? Okay? Four angels are sent out at the end of the age to destroy a third of the earth. Four is all it takes. I mean, what are we dealing with here? Okay. And what happens in act two is that a third of those angels rebel against God. They join a rebellion. It's a coup. Okay. Satan, who was the captain of the armies of God, he was perhaps the most powerful perhaps the most beautiful angel. Many believe that he was the guardian of the glory of the Lord, decides out of envy that he doesn't want to play a supporting role. He wants the story to be about him. He wants center stage. He wants power. He wants worship. This is a creepy thing, but did you notice all of the really evil dictators in the world, the Idi Amin's and the Pol Pot's and the Chairman Mao's, they don't just want to rule. They want their people to worship them, right? That's creepy evil, right? That is straight out of the kingdom of darkness. So in act two, out of envy and resentment, Satan convinces a third of the angels in heaven to join him in a revolt against the Trinity. And there is war in heaven. In act two, the evil one is hurled down, but he is not destroyed, right? Where is the evil one hurled to? The earth. That's why in Genesis chapter three, when you have the garden and the beauty and the goodness of creation, evil is already there 
looking for its opportunity to strike again. He knows that he cannot attack the ramparts of heaven again. He knows that he can't. And so his plan now is destroy the human race. The enemy is simply trying to get his vengeance on God. He's simply trying to break the heart of God by ravaging his sons and daughters. Okay. That is the story you have been born into. What do you do with stories like, um, was, it, was it a famous Christian singer? I think it was Michael W. Smith, who backing out of the driveway one morning, runs over his own child. <coughs> Chapman. Chapman, it was Chapman, thank you. Runs over his own child and kills him, right? What do you do with friends that we know of recently who husband was out of town and the wife was alone in their apartment, and it gets broken in, and she gets assaulted. Lovely Christian couple. What do you do with that? What do you do with your story and the wounds that you have encountered, the disappointments, the struggles, the setback? Why is life so hard? You have to have interpretation for that, or you will lose heart, and it will be very, very difficult to trust God, really. We end up, again, we end up living this dividedness. There's a dividedness in us, part of us that is trying to believe and part of us that is in hopelessness and despair. We, we literally get fragmented as human beings and we live as a house divided because we do not have the story. We do not have understanding. And more importantly, how the story and understanding can lead us to restoration and wholeheartedness and lead us into greater victory, teach us to be warriors. Okay, so at the end of Act 2, you have the fall of the evil one and his armies, but they are not destroyed. They are still in the story. Now you can go to Genesis chapter 1, the creation of the human race. And the human race is created to join God in his war against evil. We are meant to be his intimate allies. Right? And the first part of Genesis is just exquisite, right? You get the waterfalls and the oceans, you get the prairies, you get vineyards and Cabernet grapes and hops and barley and all those wonderful things that God gave to us, right? <laughs> God creates this delicious earth with all of these treasures in it waiting to be discovered. Think of it, right? No mountain has been climbed. No song has been written. No one has discovered physics. There's this whole world waiting to be explored and discovered and mastered and cultivated and cared for. That is what we are given. God gives it to us. The highest heavens belongs to the Lord, the psalm says, but the earth he has given to the sons of men. Okay, so we were created to be the lords of the earth. Small L, but the lords of the earth, right? We had dominion. Evil one comes in and he begins to weave his deception over Eve and over Adam. And the deception is the same thing he uses in our lives right now. It basically goes like this. God is holding out on you. He's not really good. You can't fully trust him. You've got to reach for what you want. You've got to take things into your own hands here. You, you've got to get a little something going for yourself, right? That's the deception here is to make the story about you and to grasp and to strive and, and envy, right? To join him in his envy, to join him in his mistrust of God. And what is so bitter and brutal about tragedy and trauma and heartbreak is that he uses the suffering of our lives to try and sow into us his hatred and mistrust of God. You just get that doubt. You get that, ah, uh, you pull back a little bit. There's not the intimacy anymore. You're not really sure. And and then all the addictions start coming in because they look like the offer of life and you know, all of that story. That's Genesis chapter three, the fall of man. And there's this beautiful moment where God comes into the garden, not as an angry father, not furious. It's just astounding. God comes into the garden. He says, Adam, where are you? Isn't that beautiful? I mean, come on. He knows where he is. He's over there behind the mulberry bush, right? <laughs> Buck naked, you know? But he doesn't go, Adam, get out here now. 
It's just Adam. Adam, where are you? Right? Like hide and seek, like a father and his son. It's so beautiful. Right? God comes looking for his sons and daughters. And there in Genesis is promised the great rescue. He says, oh boy, you guys. Oh boy. Oh boy. Why did you do this? What have you done? What have you done? He explains, your life is going to be really hard now. Adam, for you, the thorns and thistles thing, right? That's not just for farmers or gardeners, right? Or or every guy who had a white collar job gets to escape the curse. What he is explaining, he says, um, the very thing that matters most to you, feeling powerful in the world, feeling competent, winning, achieving, conquering, that is really going to come hard now. It's by the sweat of your brow. I'm going to introduce futility into your life to drive you back to me, to drive you back to me, because now you're committed to an independent life. And Eve, Eve, it's not just about babies. Um, He says to Eve, he says, I'm going to introduce into you a relational ache that nothing in this world can fill. And that's going to drive you back to me. But there in that moment, he promises the rescue. This is just another cool, cool thing. Why does every great movie have a rescue, right? Rogue One, phenomenal rescue scene in there. And, you know, Maximus comes and cast down the emperor. And why does, you know, Aslan comes and frees Narnia. Why does every story have a rescue? Why is this written in the human heart? Why do we know this? You can't create a good story without one. Because all of this is telling you about the story, our story, because there's a rescue, right? Jesus of Nazareth. Okay. And and that's why, like when the church tries to tell the story, you are a sinner, but God in his love and mercy has come to rescue you. It's like coming into the movie an hour and a half late. Like, what is that about? What's the cross? Why does any of that matter? You don't understand that without the rest of the story. You are a son. Your story starts with sonship and dignity and this heart that was given to you. The fall of man is a big deal because it was from such a high place. Right? And the intervention of Jesus of Nazareth. Like, you read the Christmas story, And it doesn't look like a way in a manger, you know? You read Revelation chapter 12, and it is war. It is war. The coming of Jesus, the enemy freaks out. Herod orders the execution of every little boy, two years old and younger, like homicide, genocide, massacre. Like the enemy is freaking out because he knows that his hold over the earth is in jeopardy. He's not quite sure of God's plan. He doesn't know everything. And he really blows it when he kills Jesus, right? Because he thought that would do it. And it backfired terribly, right? Paul says that the rulers of this world had known they would never have slain the prince of glory. The overthrow of evil is very costly. It cost Jesus his life. It cost all of his closest friends their lives. The enemy tried to stop the church through persecution, right? You were born into a world at war, my brothers. It explains so much. It explains so very much. Why do we know that like courage and bravery are essential to masculine strength? Why do we know that there's some quality in those firefighters that ran up the stairs in the World Trade Center while everyone else was running down? Why do we know that is essential to the heart of God and to the heart of a man? What, because of the story you're created for because of what we are designed to be. We were born into a world at war. You are a warrior. And so much of what has happened to you, that's not the hand of God. That is your enemy coming after you to steal, kill, and destroy, as Jesus warned. It's not God. He gave his life for you. He is fighting for your restoration but you've got to take sides with him. 
You've got to get right interpretation. You've got to reject the enemy's bitterness, resentment, and hatred of God. Look at the hatred in the world today. Holy cow. Like there is just demonic hatred, just saturating politics and racial relations and international relations. And, you know, it, it's war. It is war. And you were created to take your part in that. Act three is the coming of Jesus, the rescue of God, the rescue of the human heart. And that's why I said last night that the recovery of the warrior heart is so essential. What's amazing about that scene, Hitler built the Atlantic Wall to try, because he knew the invasion would come. He knew it would come somewhere on the west coast of his empire. He didn't know where exactly. So from Norway to Spain, he built a long system of artillery and pillboxes and entrenchments and garrisons to try and hold out. Evil is belligerent. Evil is entrenched. Things that get taught in the church about the evil one. The devil is a toothless lion. No, Jesus said he can steal, kill, and destroy. So if Jesus says he can steal, kill, and destroy, then what does the enemy have the capacity to do? Steal, kill, and destroy. Okay, he's not a toothless lion, right? And, and seriously, I'm quoting chapels in Christian schools that my sons went in, okay? The, the chapel speaker that gets up and says, it's not your job to resist the devil, that's God's job. No, that's actually heresy. You're commanded in Scripture to resist. You're commanded to join the fight. What do you give an armor for, for heaven's sakes? Well, I got this sword. I'm not sure what I'm supposed to do with it. You know, like, we just, it's like, it's like the whole church is dressed up for a hockey game, but they never get sent into the arena. We're all just sitting there, you know, holding sticks and we got our, you know, helmets on, but there's no game, right? There's no fight. There's no, oh, oh, there is. There is. The climax of Act 3 is the death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ. We are living now very, very close to the end of Act 3. That's why the war has heated up so much in the world. Why evil, right? Did you, suicide is the leading cause of death for our young men. Second in the U.S., first in the U.K., but kind of depends on statistics. Like, whoa, all the guys that are getting taken out by meth and addictions, the pornography, the dark, dark sexual stuff. You see the ravages. Like, I'm not being overly dramatic. I'm just stating things for the way they are in the world. Okay, and there's no fear. There's no fear. Okay, because you have been given everything you need through the victory of Christ to learn how to enforce it in your kingdom. And you have been given the opportunity of wholeheartedness to the deep inner ministry of Jesus. Like, you're not alone. You haven't been left abandoned in this fight. We live somewhere towards the end of Act 3. Act 4 is coming very soon. Oh, man. But this is where, this is where Satan's done his greatest heist. This is where the counterfeit, the thievery is most evident. You want to see how he stole the gospel? What's heaven? What's Act 4? Yeah, it's the eternal church service in the sky. Right? Oh, come on. What have you been taught ever since your youth, if you've been to church, what do we do in heaven? Right? That's right. We worship the Lord. I don't know how many, I mean, God bless you, how many worship leaders I've heard get up there and say, I just can't wait till we're in the presence of the Lord and we just get to worship him forever. Now, just think about this for a moment. Just think about this. The little boy in you, knows he's a warrior, knows he was made for great adventure, knows he was made for romance, beauty, intimacy, all that, right? But what you get, right, what you get is to stand in the presence of God and sing, when we've been there 10,000 years. Just think about it. Okay, you've been there singing songs for 10,000 years, and that's just the start. <laughs> it's hell. It's absolute hell. It, no, it's horrifying. That's, that, that is so 
that is so awful, that is so reviling to the, like, yeah, of course you worship God in heaven. All of life will be worshiped. But why are, why are the parable of sheep and the goats, the sheep are given kingdoms for heaven's sakes. The parable of the talents and the minas, when the, when the master returns and he gives his faithful ones, he gives them the whole estate. First off, you don't spend your eternal life in heaven. You spend it here on the restored earth. In Revelation 21, when John sees the new Jerusalem coming out of heaven, where does it land? On the earth. <laughs> One of the most extraordinary promises Jesus ever spoke is in 1928, Matthew 19, 28, when he says, I tell you the truth that the restoration of all things. Jesus describes the coming of the kingdom of God as the restoration of all things. Music, the art, right? Adventure, everything that you hold dear. Okay. He says, those of you who have lost loved ones, relationships, homes, like actual houses, lands, your careers, your unrealized dreams. He says, oh, all that is completely restored to you. God does not vaporize the earth like the death star. And we all get airlifted to heaven where we sit around singing forever. That is not the gospel. The gospel is the great restoration. Revelation 21, he says, I am making everything new. He does not say, I am making all new things. He, I am restoring you. I am restoring the earth. I am giving you back everything that you have lost. And this is why the early Christians were absolutely unstoppable and invincible. They're like, what are you going to do? Kill us? You can't kill us. Like, you literally can't. I don't die. I'm an immortal being. What you, there is nothing you can take from me that God will not restore. Nothing. I can suffer no loss in this life that will not be totally restored to me. All right? That's what makes people invincible when they have context and interpretation and the, and the understanding of the right story. There's such a dark view of the end in the world right now. It's zombies and it's apocalyptic and it's, it's people shanking each other in, in the streets with garden tools, you know, it's, <laughs> Blaine said. It's, it's it, right? All this post-apocalyptic stuff and people look at politics and everything and it's all darkness. That is the enemy putting his spin on the end of the story. Oh, guys, the end of the story is awesome. It is your total and complete restoration, right? I mean, Jesus, he walks out of the tomb. It's still Jesus. It's still him. He doesn't turn into something else, right? They recognize him. He has meals with them. He does the most ordinary things with them. He goes to the beach with them. They have a cookout on the beach. You're like, you're the son of the living God. You've just been resurrected. You're having barbecues. It just, how, it doesn't look spiritual to me. Exactly. It's the restoration of all things, of you, of this world, of life, and of everything you hold dear. Right? That is the coming of the kingdom. Jesus goes hand-to-hand -hand combat with the evil one, throws him down. John 14, now is the prince of this world cast down. Now is he judged, but it costs him his life. And you are those warriors there. Right. And we will see him again soon, soon. Meanwhile, we know the restoration of all things is coming. It absolutely changes your view of loss. It totally changes your expectations of this life and the pressures that you put on this life and on people to come through for you. And you realize, oh, right now we are in a great fight. And there are incredible tastes of the banquet. God is lavish. There are gifts. There is joy. There is this world, right? He has given us all things richly to enjoy, but we're not at the feast yet. We're not at the campfires of the kingdom yet, right? We are nearing the end of Act 3. The great restoration is coming, and God has never betrayed you. He has never betrayed you. It is the war my brothers, it is the war that has caused your wounding and the destruction and the loss. It's the war. That's not God. 
That's not his heart for you. His heart for you is clearly shown there in the arena. Gave his life. Gave his life for you. Right? That's why Paul says in Romans 5, God proves his love right, in the death of Christ. Because if you kind of look each day to go, well, does he love me, doesn't he? Man, that's going to take you on a roller coaster. That is going to take you on emotional whiplash. You are deeply and profoundly loved. You have been absolutely ransomed and rescued. He is fully committed to your restoration. And we are in the midst of a great fight. That is the story that we are living in right now. That was John Eldridge from our August boot camp speaking on the larger story. Now, if that piques your interest, there's several resources we offer at ransomedheart.com that you can get. The first is the book Epic by John Eldridge. We also have on video Boot Camp Live. It's the entire boot camp in video form that you can go through, and it includes the session, The Larger Story. And then if you'd rather hear audio, we have the Platinum Collection, which includes all the sessions from a boot camp, the best of the best over 10 years, plus several other sessions. So whether you want to listen to it or watch it or read about it, come to ransomedheart.com where we have more. I'm Alan Arnold, and I invite you to join us again next week on the Ransomed Heart Podcast.